Some of my students have been asking questions about the aggregate supply, aggregate demand model, which admittedly is one of the more complicated things that we do in a Principles of Economics course. It is slightly complicated, uh, but it certainly is something that just about any student can quickly master. So I'm putting together a series of short videos to walk through the basics of manipulating this model. And it all starts with understanding what sort of questions we're trying to answer. So I'm going to bring in our, our graph here. It's very important that we know what the axes are. So let me just grab the other axis here. All right, so in this model, we are studying price level, consumer price index. Uh, you can look that text up, or you can look that term up just about anywhere to get a feel for what that is. And on the horizontal axis, we are trying to find out what's going to happen with real gross domestic product or real GDP. So for uh, our relationships, we need two of the three relationships to determine what macroeconomic equilibrium is. Let's bring those in here. Start with short run aggregate supply. This represents the producer side of the market in the short run. We can also bring in aggregate demand. And this represents the consumption or net expenditure side of the market. More on that later. First, I want to direct your attention to our equilibrium. The equilibrium indicates two bits of information, one representing the level of the price level. Um, again, the CPI, which is an index uh, with a base year of 100. So if the CPI goes up, the equilibrium will move in an upward fashion. If it goes down from 100 to, say, 80 or 95, then the intersection, our equilibrium will move in a downward direction. The equilibrium also contains information related to the level of production or real GDP. Uh, forward movement is an improvement in production and backward movement is a reduction in production or real GDP. So let's go ahead and put in our equilibrium and we'll map it out to both of its bits of information. And here is our starting point related to price level and our starting point related to real GDP. For a principles of economics course, generally what we're interested in is direction and movement and not magnitude of the movement. So putting numbers to these locations is not that important. Now, the final relationship that you'll need to have an understanding of for this model to work is LAS. And LAS's position is of interest. If LAS is located directly on our macroeconomic equilibrium, that's called a full employment equilibrium. If LAS is somewhere to the left of macroeconomic equilibrium, that means that the equilibrium is out in front of LAS. In other words, the economy is really booming. And we call the difference between real GDP and LAS an, expansion, an inflationary gap. Now, if the opposite is true and real GDP is below potential GDP or LAS, that means there's a recession on. This is a bad time. Generally, when we manipulate this market model, we're going to be starting with a long-run equilibrium or a full employment equilibrium.
So our starting point will generally be where LAS is the same as real GDP, in which case we can go ahead and we can go ahead and relabel this potential GDP. And that indicates that indicates that cyclical unemployment is zero. In other words, situation normal as it relates to the business cycle. So now we have the basic framework uh, for the model. What's left is for us to focus on each of these relationships in turn, LAS, SAS, and AD, in order to find out how to manipulate these relationships or when to manipulate the relationships, all in an effort to determine what happens to our outcome variables, price level, and real GDP. So now we need to examine all of the shift and relationship factors at play in the three relationships we're looking at. And then eventually we'll use these relationships to manipulate the model and find out what happens to price level and real GDP. Let's get started by looking at LAS. So we zoom right on in here, LAS, LAS. I'm going to get real close on LAS here. So LAS is equal to a function of, try to recall what our vertical axis was labeled. You may recall that it was labeled price level. The variable on the vertical axis is always a relationship factor. Now try to recall the slope of LAS. Was it positive, negative, or vertical? If you recall it was vertical, that will help you to remember that there is no relationship between long-run aggregate supply or potential GDP and the price level. Next, we need to know what factors will change, what factors exist that when they change, they will shift LAS. And a good way to think about this is a firm wanting to expand productivity. If you are a firm and you want to expand productivity, you have some choices. You can increase labor. In the macroeconomic picture, this is the full employment quantity of labor. Now, there's always only ever one relationship factor, and that is our price level. So the full employment quantity of labor must be a shift factor. And when labor goes up, generally we think of production or real GDP supplied as going up. So this will be a direct shift factor. And what this means is when when full employment quantity of labor goes up, LAS goes up or shifts right. Okay, there are other shift factors as well. Capital. We use a K here to indicate capital. So if you owned a business, you could increase um, your, the size of your factory, you could buy more equipment, better tools, and that would help you to increase productivity. Capital, stock, or the value of the productive resources in the U.S. economy is positively or directly related to LAS 
where all of this applies. In other words, you know, when, when capital increases, then LAS is going to increase or shift to the right. That's what that positive means. Okay. Also, technology. These are both shift factors. An increase in technology will also shift long-run aggregate supply to the right. They move together. Our final shift factor is natural resource stock, which is also a shift factor and also directly related to LAS. If you want to improve an economy in a long-run, meaningful, sustainable way, what must be addressed is the full employment quantity of labor, the capital stock or the amount of the value of productive resources at work in the economy, the state of technology, or access to natural resources. Our next video will continue this process by looking at one of our other two relationships. So in terms of progress, this is the third video in the sequence. In the first video, we set up the model and explained how the axes inform the outcome. In the second video, we went into detail looking at long-run aggregate supply. In this video, we're going to go into detail discussing short-run aggregate supply and the factors that will move that curve. So I will just zoom in here on short-run aggregate supply, and we will discuss SAS. Now in our model, SAS is equal to a function of, think about the vertical axis, our relationship factor is price level. And once again, that is our relationship factor. So that is, it. Uh, consumer price index will not shift SAS, but will move us along the short-run aggregate supply curve. Think about the shape of the short-run aggregate supply curve. Is this going to be a direct or an inverse relationship? If you can recall, that is an upward sloping curve. That is that real GDP supplied moves together with the price level you will recall that this is a direct relationship. In other words, they move together. As far as shift factors, we're going to start off with input prices. If you think from the perspective of a producer, it's straightforward to recognize that when input prices go up, in other words, the costs of producing what it is you're producing goes up, that's going to be a rather unfortunate thing. In other words, it's going to make you less likely to bring your products to market at any price level. So this will be an inverse relationship. Now, you may recall that input prices were not in our function for long-run aggregate supply. The reason for that is, in our model, in the short run, input prices are assumed to be fixed. In other words, they're held constant. Another way of saying that is a change in input prices will shift short-run aggregate supply. Now, why don't they shift long-run aggregate supply? The reason that input prices don't shift long-run aggregate supply is that in the long run, in fact, the long run is defined as the amount of time that allows for both input prices and output prices to fully adjust. So that is why we get the vertical shape of the long run aggregate supply curve, when both input prices and output prices go up, firms have no incentive to increase production. Whereas, 
if output prices are the only thing to go up while input prices are held constant, firms do have a short run incentive to ramp up production to take advantage of the higher output prices. But let's go back to input prices. So in our course, we cover several broad categories for input prices. The hardest to remember and potentially most important in our model is nominal wage. Now the nominal wage is an important input price, um, but it is nominal. In other words, uh, another way you might see this stated is this is our money wage or the straightforward current and dollar valued wage, non-adjusted for inflation. That's going to become important later on. Other input prices that you may hear used in the problems are the price of raw materials. For example, the big one is oil, but also steel, and also timber, etc. Okay. Finally, the last shift factor uh, for short run aggregate supply is what we just finished working on, which is long run aggregate supply. Now, as you might have guessed, if a long run aggregate supply increases, that is, if an economy becomes more productive in a sustainable way, we would anticipate that SAS will shift together with LAS. So they move together. Um, long run aggregate supply up. LAS, or rather, SAS shifts to the right. Input prices up. SAS will shift to the left. So this wraps up the short-run aggregate supply side of the model. If you have a problem that names the nominal wage as having changed or the price of these raw materials having changed, you will shift SAS and only SAS. If, however, the problem indicates that a factor related to LAS has changed. Think about those factors, see if you can recall what they are. Then what you'll be graphing is a shift in both LAS and SAS at the same time. Our next video will feature a discussion of our final relationship in the model. We will go back and discuss factors that shift aggregate demand. This video is our final video in the foundational, setting up the foundational concept of the aggregate supply, aggregate demand model. Uh, the first video we set about discussing the outcomes, that is changes in the consumer price index and real GDP. Next we talked about the factors that shift long run aggregate supply and then we talked about factors that shift SAS. In this video, we'll discuss factors that shift aggregate demand. Um, it's nice that we're able to zoom out because this allows you a checkpoint to think, do I remember what these shift factors are? Do I remember the shift factors for short run aggregate supply? Uh, if you give that a thought and you can't come up with those models or they have some missing components, feel free to watch those other videos again. At this time, let's zoom in on aggregate demand and look at the mechanics of moving that around. So aggregate demand. AD is equal to a function of, and at this point, hopefully you're very versed with how to find the relationship factor. Recall the graph and the vertical axis. You may recall that it was price level, otherwise known as the CPI, also known as output prices. Again, this is a relationship factor, meaning it will not shift aggregate demand. Additionally, um, if you think about the model, perhaps sketch it out, you will recall that aggregate demand is downward sloping, so we will sign this relationship as being inverse. In other words, the price level and real GDP demanded are going to move in opposite directions as we move along the aggregate demand curve. In terms of shift factors, there is a shortcut. You may recall from earlier chapters that real GDP 
is equal to, and we had that formula, right? Consumption plus investment plus government expenditure plus net exports. Okay, all of these are going to be our shift factors for this model. So we can just throw these in here. Consumption, investment, that is the purchase by firms of productive resources for the use of uh, aiding in productivity, government expenditure, and finally, net exports. It is important to keep in mind the net exports, there's a formula here. This is exports minus imports. That is the value of goods flowing out of, for example, the U.S., which is our typical country of interest. So the value of goods flowing out of the country minus the value of the goods flowing into the country from other nations. Now, if price level is our relationship factor, then all the rest of these must be shift factors. And we can see from the formula, right, these are all additive, so we don't have to think very hard about the sign. Consumption up, aggregate demand up. Aggregate demand shifts to the right. Investment up, aggregate demand shifts to the right. Government expenditure up, aggregate demand shifts to the right. And finally, net exports up will result in aggregate demand also shifting to the right. Now the tricky part about the aggregate demand functions is there's just so much structure underneath this model. So let's work a little bit at adding that structure. If you come down from consumption, several things will systematically alter consumption in an economy. We will start with money supply. Money supply up, consumption up. Additionally, and simultaneously, actually, if you think about our money market model, when you move money supply, you have a direct impact on the interest rate. And if the interest rate goes up, we will see less consumption. Fiscal policy also comes into play in that when income taxes are altered, you see a change in consumption. And of course, if income taxes go up, you're going to see a drop in consumption. So this is also an inverse factor. Our final uh, underlying cause that will cause systematic changes in consumption is expected future income. Okay. So if you hear any of these things mentioned in a problem, it will depend on which one is indicated, but if money supply, for example, goes down, consumption is going to move with money supply, so consumption will go down. And aggregate demand is going to move with consumption, so aggregate demand will go down. So money supply down, aggregate demand down. However, if we talk about increasing the income tax, consumption is going to move opposite of the income tax, income tax up, consumption down, consumption down, aggregate demand down. And that's how the signs work, and that's how they work in a stacked environment like this. So let's switch gears and talk about things that systematically affect income or the purchase of capital by firms. Money supply is going to work the same way for investment. Interest rate is going to work the same way for investment. There is one other factor here, which is expected future profit. Remembering that profit is revenue minus cost. Um, so if business outlook is good, we should expect to see more investment and vice versa. So this would be a positive. Okay, now moving on to government expenditure. If the problem mentions government expenditure, it will be straightforward that you're going to need to move aggregate demand with government expenditure. There is one that's a little confusing in that you'll often...
see war mentioned in a problem. And we are talking about a U.S. war. This is a foreign-fought war without a lot of casualties. We're simply spending money, right? And so war is positively associated with government expenditure, which is, again, positively associated with aggregate demand. Finally, net exports. We will have two systematic changes that affect net exports. One will be foreign income. So if things go well for other countries, we know from our class that if our neighbors are doing well, we are doing well. This will have a positive sign. The foreign exchange rate is a little trickier. If the foreign exchange rate goes up, or if there's a strengthening in the U.S. dollar, that means that Foreign goods become cheaper and more, more attractive. And so we will see more inputs, and more imports rather. And we will see less exports because our goods will become less attractive, more expensive for foreign consumers. So as a result of the foreign exchange rate going up, we will see a decrease in net exports and as a result of that decrease in net exports, net exports moves with aggregate demand, a decrease in aggregate demand. Um, if you need details on the foreign exchange rate, you can look back to the notes or look that up online. Uh, but this wraps up the discussion of the aggregate demand mechanics. The next video will take all this knowledge that we've gained and we'll do some shifting. So you can see all of this structure is hidden beneath this useful tool for calculating changes in price level. That is inflation, deflation, changes in the CPI, and also changes in real GDP, recession, expansion, recession, expansion. In the next video, we'll go ahead and make some of those changes relying on the underlying structure and uh, wrap up our discussion on the ASAD model. All right, so here we are. We have developed, at this point, a lot of underlying structure. For each of our, for each of our three relationships here. Um, at some point, you'll need to understand all of this underlying structure here. What are we going to need to be able to do? Well, we have to look at a list like this one here, and we need to be able to link each of these to their corresponding relationships and also to sign the nature of that relationship so that we can handle a shift. For example, let's just grab one of them. Price of oil. Where does it belong? Does it belong here or here or here. Money supply. Does it affect LAS? Does it affect SAS? Or does it affect AD? Technology. Will that affect LAS? SAS? Or AD? If we don't know the answer to these questions, not only the question of which relationship does it affect, but also does it encourage or discourage that kind of behavior, we won't be able to move on with this example at all. So if we understand the underlying structure, this is no problem. When I talk about when I talk about price of oil, what should come to mind is, well, that is an input price. Where are input prices? Well, input prices only affect SAS. Let's have a look. Here they are, input prices. And the price of oil is right here.
War. Where does war live? Well, war is in a government expenditure, and so war will live down in A.D. Money supply. Money supply is going to affect A.D. as well. Full employment quantity of labor is going to affect L.A.S. L.A.S. also shifts S.A.S. So we once we get the matching down, well, then we need to know the direction. What direction will LAS shift as a result of a change in the full employment quantity of labor? Let's have a look. We'll drill down, and here we see the full employment quantity of labor. It is a shift factor. It will shift LAS, and if full employment quantity of labor goes up, it will shift LAS to the right. So let's try a couple of these. We won't go through an exhaustive list, but we will get comfortable and some work will be required on your part to handle the rest. So let's see. Let's pick one. Um, let's go ahead and do technology. So, and let's give a certain sign in technology. So if technology, for example, gets better, what does that mean for our model? Well, you may recall that technology was a shift factor for LAS. So let's get a new LAS curve. Now, LAS is going to shift as a result of an increase in technology. You may have guessed that an increase in technology is a positive thing for production and that LAS will shift to the right, giving us LAS prime. The tricky bit is that when LAS shifts, SAS also shifts because LAS is a shift factor for SAS. They move together and they move to the same degree. So we need, that's hence the horizontal line. We have to shift them by the same amount. So we'll take SAS and shift it over to where it intersects LAS at the same point. And now we have our SAS Prime. Uh, if you're getting flustered, feel free to hit rewind. This is our most involved shift. Now, where is equilibrium? You may recall that early on we spoke about how equilibrium is always the intersection between aggregate demand and SAS. This SAS is no longer relevant because we have a new SAS. So our new equilibrium will be the intersection of the relevant SAS, SAS Prime, and AD. This bit of information here tells us two things. It tells us that as a result of the increase in technology, price level has fallen and real GDP has increased. Okay, this is a good thing. So without any changes to aggregate demand, this is what the graph will look like for a shift in LAS, which also shifts SAS. Factors that will do that are technology, full employment, quantity of labor, natural resource stock, and capital. Let's start over. New shift factor. Let's talk about an increase in let's talk about an increase in the money supply. Money supply up. You may recall that money supply affects both consumption and investment in our aggregate demand model. So we will need to shift and that it's directly related. More money, uh, more expenditure on consumption, more investment. Aggregate demand is going to shift to the right. Let's come and grab our new aggregate demand curve. So we're going to take it and we're going to shift it to the right. Actually, I want a better, I want a better curve here. And now we have AD prime. And of course, our equilibrium, as always, is the intersection between the relevant AD and SAS curves. And this tells us that as a result of the increase in money supply, price level has gone up and real GDP 
has gone up. Now the last of the relationships for us to experiment with will be SAS. So rack your brain, think about what is the only thing that will cause SAS to shift without also shifting LAS. And the only answer is an input price. Examples of input price in our list. Price of oil. Nominal wage. Price of steel. There are others, but that's a pretty good list. So what do we do to our model if an input price, say, goes down? So let's decrease the price of oil. This is something that's happened in our economy recently. What are the impacts of a decrease in the price of oil? Well, if you recall, in an SAS relationship, input prices are indirectly related. So a decrease in the price of oil will actually increase SAS or shift it to the right. We will grab a line. New SAS. And as a result of the increase in SAS, we have a new equilibrium. And this new equilibrium brings price levels down. And it's going to bring real GDP up. Notice that here we have an, in, um, an inflationary gap. The Fed is going to want to do something about this. And we'll talk about what they might do in future videos. I hope you found this series to be helpful. If you did, please let me know. Um, we can continue to crank some of these out. Of course, class is the best option, but these videos sure do help if you get overwhelmed. Uh, thanks for your time, and I'll see you in class.